Hey, welcome to episode number 42 of Builder Funnel Radio. In this episode, I sit down with John Palumbo and we talk about the world of sales, but we kind of dive into a few interesting components of that. We talk about influence and persuasion. We also talk about storytelling and how it's a big buzzword today, uh, but we uncover a few things that you can actually take away and use and start building your own stories in your sales process. And then we also talk about whether you need to be an introvert or an extrovert to be really strong in the sales world. So uh, stay tuned and enjoy episode 42 with John Palumbo. Hey, John, thanks for joining me today. Thanks. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to have a conversation about sales today because I think, uh, I don't know, I've never talked to a business owner that isn't really interested in improving their sales, so uh, I think it will apply to a lot of people. But uh, before we get too far down the path, I guess maybe you can share a little bit of how you got into the world of sales. I know you've been in in that industry or, you know, in the um, sales uh, profession, so to speak, for, you know, 15 years or so, but you know, how did you first get into sales? My background is going to be uh, new home sales, working for builder developers uh, almost exclusively. I, I had a variety of jobs prior to that, anything from selling insurance to cars to um, several other items when I was a kid. But uh, I got into the real estate business relatively young, and I have stayed there. Uh, working for builders and developers. I worked for one company, Aronoff Realty out of Montgomery, Alabama, for better than 20 years as their director of sales and a managing director of sales and marketing in the southeastern United States, handling all of their multifamily division. And so there's my background. And then over the years, it's just evolved uh, to working literally all over the world now. So That's awesome. That's super cool. And what, what is it, do you think, that you like... Um, you know, so much about the world of new home sales versus, you know, other industries? Uh, new home sales, I, I don't know that it's, it's really any different. It just happens to be the arena that I came through. But selling is selling, meeting, greeting, demonstrating, prospecting, and closing with customers becomes uh, paramount in any business. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, just seem to forget that sales drive everything so when sales aren't happening the accountants aren't happy the production people aren't happy and the entire team is not happy when sales are not happy so it's just a it's an important function of any business yeah yeah i uh i remember from a young age talking to uh my uncle and he was also in the the building business and he said nothing happens until something gets sold and so i think that you know kind of proves your point there but um i guess you know, selling seems to be a lot about influence and persuasion. I guess, can you talk about the difference between those two things? I don't know that there's a difference between them. I think they go hand in hand. Okay. So in today's business world, understanding how to influence and persuade your customers becomes really the most important ingredient in making a successful business and ending up at the end of the year, whether you're going to be in the red or the black. And influence is, a lot of people don't really understand the difference between influence and persuasion. Uh, and I'll hear them say, well, you know, I want to learn how to be more persuasive. Well, being persuasive is good. Being influential is good. But when you put them together, they become powerful. And really, one does not work without the other. What we truly want to do as professionals is, and I ask this all the time of, you know, people that are in my programs, whether I'm working for private companies or in large uh, conferences and conventions, it's always the same question. Would you rather be a good negotiator or would you rather be better at influencing and persuading people? And here's what I mean. The ability to influence the way they think so that you can persuade them to spend their money with you. Hmm. And that's really what it's about. It's influencing the way they think in order to persuade them to spend their money with us. And there's two things going on here. First is influencing the mind so that it can make its own decisions. And persuasion is being able to take that influenced mind and lead it in the right direction. 
So influence and persuasion, they go together hand in hand. One without the other it is not an effective team. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you, I guess, how do you go about building that influence, kind of that, that first part of it where you're trying to, yeah, influence somebody's, you know, mind or their mental state or how they perceive something or think about something? I mean, that's a big question. How do you go about influencing somebody? Yeah. That's like saying, how do you become the president of the United States? <laughs> um, there's a long process that goes with this. And the ability to start influencing people begins with a few key factors. Your integrity, your character, your, uh, what your overall goal is with each client that you're meeting with. And is your goal to manipulate them? If so, influence and persuasion can be manipulative. And I guess if you want to use the word manipulative, some people say, well, then that's not good. Manipulative can be good or bad, depending on what your intention is. So intention becomes the key element here, what your intentions are with each customer. And if it's in order to help them achieve the maximum results of what they're doing in front of you at that moment, whether it's looking to buy a car, insurance, a home, or, or whatever it is, in any business, is your intent to influence their way of thinking in order to be more persuasive in your selling effort? And that requires you understanding them. So the first part of influence is really understanding them first. You can't influence somebody without understanding where their heads are to begin with. What are they thinking? What are they looking for? Why now, which is critical with any product. Why have you decided to look now, buy now, make the move now. And so understanding them. So an initial conversation in discovery, which is what a lot of people would call that, just good old fashioned discovery, uh, becomes important. Without discovery, you can't begin the process of influence. Remember, influence is a way of helping them think more clearly about your product rather than having filters that may be there. For instance, you might say, well, what is a filter? A filter is something they heard before they came in. Uh, someone's going to buy a Chevrolet and they just finished talking to somebody that drives a Ford and the person driving a Ford says, oh, you don't want a Chevrolet because, and you know, this, 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 and this. Well, that's a filter that's gone in. So they walk into the Ford dealership immediately with filters in place. And unless those filters, you understand what those filters are, there's no way you can indulge them with your own propaganda, for lack of a better word, but with your own information without first understanding what filters might be in place. So this is just good old conversation. And the, the sales associate simply saying, may I ask you a few simple questions? And beginning to dig and understand a little bit. And a lot of salespeople don't do that. A lot of times what they want to do is just launch into a presentation, telling them all about their product, what it can do, and the services they provide. If it's in new home sales, then they want to just start showing them the home. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our builder. Let me tell you a little bit about our home. Have you heard about us before? And they just launch into telling everything about them. Some of those things are going to be immaterial and completely irrelevant to the customer. You won't know that unless you have at least some dialogue going with them so that you can begin the storytelling process. I, I think probably the best lessons I've learned over the years is uh, going through HUD uh, training, which everybody in the United States, I think, has to do that today to you know understand how to treat people equally and how everybody's the same and you can't discriminate against race, creed, color, and a variety of other things. But the, the reality is not everybody gets the same story. While there's, there's semblance in, in the story, there's a similarity in every story. The stories change ever so gently for the person's needs their wants and their desires. And so once <coughs> you understand what those are, the story begins to gently change as you make your presentation in order to customize it to the customer. You're not treating them different, you're treating them better. There's the key. You're not treating them different, you're treating them better. When you treat everybody the same, you're really not treating the customer fairly. And there's the big difference that it makes. So these are the beginning components of influence, the storytelling process that becomes customized to the customer's needs, wants, and desires. 
Yeah. And I like how you mentioned that part about, you know, making sure that you're spending that first part, you know, asking questions, what's important to that individual, what are they looking for and kind of uncovering, like you said, maybe filters or different ways that they think about things. Uh, Cause I know I've had that happen to me with a salesperson and, you know, they get you on the phone or whatever it is and they just, boom, they just jump right into their pitch. And then you're just frustrated at the beginning because you're going, you haven't even asked anything about me. You know, you don't know what I need or what I'm looking for. And so even if what they're saying has some value to you, I don't know. I find that it's just, it's kind of a turnoff. Um, and so, you know, people like to talk about themselves. So if you, you ask some questions and suddenly, you know, they start to, to like you and, and I'm sure that's kind of how you start to build that influence. Um, I also like how you talked about intention because if your intention is good or your intention is to treat them the best or give them the best solution, um, then it's almost like you're, you're not doing yourself um, justice if you're not selling, you know, what you have to offer and, and providing them with that, that answer. Um, I feel like a lot of people, I don't know, they, when they think of persuasion or some of these um, tactics that maybe you're kind of getting into the, the mind of your prospect. They think like sleazy, scammy, you know, I guess what would you say to people that kind of have that filter of persuasion in, in the way they think about things? It's interesting you should bring that up because I wrote a book about that. Okay. <laughs> What's the sales DNA, which specifically deals with those filters that salespeople bring to the table. Salespeople bring a lot of filters to the table. For instance, I don't want to call the customer back. Why not? I don't <laughs> want to be pushy. Well, what would you, well, why, if calling them back, what makes you feel pushy? I don't want to feel like a used car salesman. There's a good one. Yeah. I don't want to feel like a used <laughs> car salesman. In fact, a lot of salespeople won't even call themselves salespeople. Specifically because the word salesman or salesperson connotates a bad image in their mind. I lay this out in what's your sales DNA crystal clearly. I, I'm, I guess it's, I'm, I'm giving it a little shameless promotion here, but I don't mean <laughs> other than your, your question hit right on it in that a lot of salespeople have those filters built into their mind. So it prevents them from giving the customer the best presentation. It prevents them from giving the customer the proper follow-up follow up, phone calls, note cards, emails, text messages, social media interaction, all of those, here's the secret, the customer deserves. It's not about being aggressive, it's about being assertive. And if the sales professional is not assertive, the salesperson doesn't deserve the business of the customer because and I can assure you, there are other salespeople out there that are going to be assertive. Assertive is giving the customer what they deserve. They deserve the attention. They deserve you listening to them so that you can follow back up with the right information. And so aggressive is trying to close somebody on product that's really not meant for them. And there's a big mistake a lot of salespeople make. They have been taught the old rule of ABC, <laughs> always be closing. And in reality, that's not a good way to sell. You should always be listening you should always be paying attention. You should always be interpreting what the customer says. Interpreting means taking what they're giving you and interpreting what they mean by it. They don't always mean exactly what is coming out of their mouths. So a professional is able to interpret what they're saying, but all of those add up to bring the customer to a complete satisfaction and by the salesperson giving them what they deserve. And again, there are more negative filters going into a lot of sales presentations by the sales professional than there ever are by the customers themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I think a lot of um, people talk about, you know, having that head trash going in, you know, as a salesperson, we tell ourselves a lot of things that, you know, just, just aren't true. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit. You know, when you and I talked, you had this phrase that you used uh, on becoming an un- negotiator. And I'm curious, can you maybe explain what you mean by that? Because I know you mentioned negotiation earlier and, you know, I'm sure people think in sales, oh, I need to be a good negotiator. But what do you mean by becoming an unnegotiator? Well, you, you just about said it yourself right there. 
a negotiator is, you know, what do you think of when you think of a good negotiator? You think of someone who is able to go out and negotiate. Well, what is negotiating? If you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it'll tell you. The negotiator is the person who has the power to make the deal on the spot. The two principles, if you would. Hmm. And so the negotiator, most salespeople do not have that power. The moment that a customer wants to make an offer less than the selling price, and you'll notice I didn't say the offered price because <laughs> we don't play that game in new home sales. The price usually is the price. But the moment someone wants to alter that, you don't have the ability to say yes or no. Most of the time you have to take it to the builder or your sales manager or your VP of sales. And they have to look at it and either reject it or come back with a counter. So really the salesperson becomes a runner between the two principles. The salesperson, most cases, does not have that power. There are some cases that you may have a listener right now listening to this and says, I have that power. And if you do, congratulations. But most of the time, most salespeople don't have that power. And also, I've never had a customer go back home and talk to one of their friends and say, you know, we just bought a beautiful home. What a great negotiator John was. Wow, <laughs> he's a great negotiator. You know, you just don't hear that. You don't hear them referring their friends over. You need to go see my friend John. He's a great negotiator. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're going to get a great deal. Yeah. So I think about negotiating in that aspect. You know, you begin to realize, hmm, there may be some validity to what I'm saying from the standpoint of negotiating is really not where it's at any longer today. Today's consumers are far more savvy. They have the ability to go to the internet and find at least 50, if not 75% of everything you're going to tell them on the internet. So they come in far more knowledgeable. They come in with far more information and far better equipped than they ever have before. So today's salesperson has to be equipped to deal with everything from the millennials to the Gen Xers, all the way to the boomers. And all three of these categories require a different skill for how they like to be dealt with, how they like to be sold to, and how they like to be interacted with. And that's what becomes important. So negotiating really doesn't hit the tier in any of those three age categories. The millennials, the Gen Xers, or the boomers. None of them want to deal with a negotiator. Yeah. The reality is you want to be an ice skater. And an ice skater, if you've ever watched the Olympics, you see an ice skater that just glides across the ice. I, I, I'm not going to speak for you, but maybe someone listening to this right now will, will understand it. Have you ever watched one of them and said, wow, that looks, they make it look so easy. It just looks so eloquent, the way they just glide around the ring. But you don't realize the magnitude of years that have gone in to making that two or three minute performance so elegant and so easy looking. This is what masters in the business of sales and marketing do. They leave it totally seamless. So no customer feels like they've ever been negotiated with, pushed, pressured, or manipulated. When you use influence and persuasion, remember the formula again, you influence their way of thinking in order to persuade them to spend their money with you. I call it the persuasion equation. And it's real simple. The head and the heart come together so that the customer makes the decision to buy. It's not the salesperson trying to close them. You really know you've done a good job when the customer says, what do we need to do to tie this up? Do you have anyone else looking at this? We really like it and we think this is the one we want. Those are when you've done a good job. When you've got to start begging for the closing and use all these tricks that people have taught about closing, you know, do you want the red carpet or the blue carpet? Shall it be <laughs> at two o'clock or at three o'clock? Those are great. Those are alternate closes. And really you need to learn all of these type things. You need to listen to some of the old masters that are out there that have taught sales. Because if there's one thing I believe, in order to break the rules, you have to know the rules. And so a lot of salespeople don't realize some of the old ways of selling so they can appreciate some of the nuances today that it takes to really deal with customers because selling has changed in the last few years from where it was before.
Yeah. Yeah. It's very different. And just going back to one of the things that you mentioned, you know, people being able to go online and get 75% of the information before they talk to the salesperson. Uh, you know, I'm curious to get your perspective on that. Cause I think that ties into sales process a little bit and understanding, uh, you know, the old way was kind of like, Oh, somebody was coming to me here. And then I was going to deliver all the information because I had all the cards basically as the salesperson, but now they can get all this information from all over the place. Um, so I guess how important is having a documented sales process and do you need to be able to adjust that based on, you know, your prospects knowledge and what information they have coming into that first meeting? Yes. And yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why, I guess, why is having a documented process so important? If you have, <laughs> for me, they're so crystal clear. A documented yeah. sales process is important, but the ability to shift on a dime is even more important. Gotcha. Because it's like we talked about early in the beginning. You know, you have to treat all customers the same, but not every customer gets the same story. And so while some customers and clients are going to be interested in one component of your presentation, others are going to be interested in the other component. And the ability to listen to them and infuse any presentation with questions throughout, it's sort of like stealthy flying. With every answer you give, you're also coming back with a question in order to dig deeper. And you're getting the permission of the customer in order to ask these questions. And so all along the way, they're giving you permission to ask them additional questions, to dig deeper, to understand them more in order to serve them better. That's it, and it's as simple as it is. And when you do that, you're able to take care of the customers better. So a structured presentation is good because some customers will follow you all the way through it, but others are gonna stop you. They're gonna have questions that are out of the norm. They're gonna have information that you don't need to go over. And by asking them what they know, it saves you time and energy for things you may not need to go over and things you may need to reiterate to them. So some things need to be gone over a few times. If there are certain specific hot buttons, you want to be able to hit those a few times throughout a presentation. And that's where mastery comes in and just learning the skills of being structured and flexible at the same time. I like to call it just being balanced really is what it's all about. And that's yeah. where a sales professional really is structured yet the ability to twist and turn at any given time without being thrown off. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I feel like you, you only get to that point through a lot of reps and like you said, mastery, you know, you're, you know, your process so well um, that you can deviate from it and you're still comfortable. You're not reading from scripts, you know, you're just, you're digging in, trying to find, you know, the pain points, trying to find where your solution meets the need of that person and, and being able to adjust on the fly. Um, I think we hear a lot about storytelling throughout, you know, the marketing process and then also in the sales process. I mean, is that something that you put an emphasis on throughout the sales process, trying to tell stories or does that play a role in influence and persuasion? I'm a storyteller by nature. Okay. He good salesperson is going to tell you they're a storyteller but and today i've noticed almost every seminar and workshop that i go to or listen to which i, I do a lot of i listen to a lot of the uh, speakers that are out there today just to stay current and relevant with where where they are in the processes today everybody is using this process of telling a story but very few people are telling you how to tell the story, yeah. <laughs> what the story needs to be about, how to structure the story. And quite frankly, storytelling is an art. So it would be the equivalent of me saying, you need to be a good artist. Well, who becomes a good artist overnight? I mean, did Picasso become a good artist overnight? Did you know, did any of these people become good artists overnight? No, they, it took them a lifetime to master this artistry. And storytelling is a form of artistry and storytelling has to have a purpose storytelling has to have a basis and storytelling has to have an ending and what it was there for a lot of salespeople just get into telling stories that have no relevance to where they're going i tell salespeople this all the time in, in seminars and workshops there's no difference between me and you except that i've written 10 books 
and most of you probably haven't. And the difference there is I was where you are. The difference, I kept notes for many, many years. I kept notes of things that came out of my mouth. I kept notes of interesting uh, situations with customers. There's no salesperson that hasn't been dealing with a customer that hasn't said something and went, wow, that was good. I can't believe that came out of my mouth. But <laughs> customers incentivize the salespeople to say things that are lurking inside of them and they really help the salespeople. The customers train salespeople better than any sales trainer sometimes. But the key is you've got to write down what is happening. You've got to keep notes. That's the only difference for me. The, the sequence of writing a lot of books over the years came from a lot of interaction with people, a lot of paying attention to the conversations and the outcomes, and then making notes for what worked and what didn't work. And that's how a book or a seminar is derived. Uh, when we go to these conventions and I go to conferences or I have clients that hire me, they are derived from personal experience, not things that I extracted from somebody else's book or from somebody else's seminar. I'm very careful to make sure that what I'm teaching is coming from the real world and not hypothetical and not something that doesn't work but sounds good in theory. And so when I'm teaching, I tell salespeople, if what I'm sharing with you now feels uncomfortable for you, then you need to really pay attention because <laughs> you're about to learn something. And if you want to do what you've always done, then you'll just simply continue to get what you've been getting. The most uncomfortable things that I will share with you in these next few hours will be the most important things for you to learn. And so, you know, there's a constant learning process that happens there. And yeah. Made yeah. Easy with What's that? There's a constant learning process that goes on with the customers. And I always encourage salespeople to just start a journal, write down these stories. This is how stories are born. This is how they become alive. And this is how you have a resource library to pull from when people say things, ask questions, throw objections. You're able to answer them sometimes in a metaphoric story, sometimes in a true to life story, sometimes in a customer based relative experience type story, but there's a variety of stories. There's horror stories, there's happy stories, there's stories about how people bought, there's stories about how people were about to buy. For every component of the process, there should be a good salesperson should have a complete list, a notebook of this story belongs here, this story belongs here because stories are a way of entering the back door of the mind rather than coming full force to the head right in front, which can sometimes be blocked. So it's a way of slipping in the back door. For instance, one of the things that I just mentioned, metaphors. Metaphors are a fabulous way of selling. They're a fabulous way of telling a story, but you need to understand what a metaphor is. You need to understand how to use it. And we use them. People use them all the time. Uh, we use them in speech. I use them all the time. You know, if, if somebody asked me and they say, good morning, how are you today? I might say, if I was a sesame seed, I'd be on a roll. <laughs> you know, it causes people to smile because they go, that's interesting. You must be in pretty good mood. Rather than me going, fine, how about you? Yeah. So that was a very short form of a metaphor. There's thousands of metaphors and we use them every day. If one jumps out of your mouth, you need to recognize it as, wow, that was a metaphor. So, you know, research and find out the variety of types of stories that, the, that are out there and learn how to do more than just tell a story. Learn how to tell a story at the right time, at the appropriate spot and the time length. You know, a story shouldn't last, you know, 15 minutes. Um, which I've seen happen with some salespeople. They should be short and to the point and carry a message at the end. So there's a lot about storytelling. It's a whole process. It's not just tell a story. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's awesome for people to hear because, yeah, it does seem to be one of those buzzwords right now. And, um, and it's a buzzword for a reason. You know, if you're using stories in the right application, the right time, right length, kind of like, you were talking about, they can be really, really powerful. But um, those are, I think, good takeaways for people to think back on their experiences, be taking notes, and you kind of develop these stories, they unfold naturally. And then uh, I feel like they probably carry a lot more weight. Um, 
Well, well here's something. That, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I thought you were finished. Uh, no, go for it. I hear people talk about storytelling that don't even do it. I hear speakers that emphasize the whole point of storytelling, and they're not even good storytellers themselves. <laughs> but yet, because it's such a buzzword out there, I think you have to pay attention to more than just the buzzword and understand the artistry and the art. There's a psychological artistry that goes into storytelling. And virtually every book I've written goes into that psychological artistry. And so I've been writing about it for 10 years and there's more than just uh, tell a story. Yeah. An art to it. It's a stroking of the paintbrush every time you do it and creating a different piece of art for every customer. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, transitioning to another topic that I think comes up a lot in the sales environment or thinking about who makes a good salesperson. One of those things is, you know, are you extroverted? I think there's this stereotype that all salespeople are kind of outgoing and bubbly and extroverted. You know, I guess, do you have thoughts on that? Have you found people they tend to be, if they're really successful salespeople, they tend to be extroverted. Does it not matter? Can you be a good salesperson if you're an introvert? Well, one of the things in services that we provide for customers is we do behavioral assessments. So one of the things that I've learned in behavioral assessments is sometimes that quiet demeanor, that sort of analytical demeanor that understands the components of sales can become the most dangerous of all salespeople. <laughs> and so what happens is they, they shift that stereotype of what the salesperson is supposed to be by, you know, gargarious and smiling and laughing. And they come off very unassuming, but they understand the skills and they have an uncanny knack for getting straight to the point with asking certain questions divulging certain facts, getting certain information in front of the customer in such a way that they become very powerful salespeople. You don't see a lot of them. So your question, which is designed around, can it actually work? Um, there is no stereotype there that, that allows that to happen. And so with that, you want to take heed if you're a sales manager and listening to this, uh, really what happens, or if you're a salesperson and you're wondering, am I cut out for sales? The answer is, there is no behavioral type. Yes, there are certain characteristics that one seems to be better than the other. How'd you like those doorbells that went off? Yeah, was, it's a nice I flavor. <laughs> I have those go off when I have a like a really great idea. I just have Yeah, it's perfect. You know, <laughs> I need to get one of those pull strings too. So. <laughs> but um, there is no certain characteristic that makes a good salesperson. There are things that I will look for characteristically, but introverted or extroverted, both can be good salespeople to answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's super helpful for people to know that because, um, you know, if you do put yourself in one of those buckets or you feel like you are extroverted or introverted, it's more about learning the skill set and, you know, what are the, what's that process look like? And so, um, yeah, that, that's awesome. And I, I want to get a little bit tactical here for a second. Um, you know, do you have a favorite sales tip um, that's kind of something quick and actionable that people can take away that maybe most people aren't utilizing uh, per se? You know, if there's any one quick tip I would give you, it would be this. When imagination comes in conflict with reality, imagination will always win. Now, if you're wondering, John, what, what does that mean? It sounds interesting, but how does that tip help us? Let me say it one more time. When imagination comes in conflict with reality, imagination will always win. The reason I share that is because if most salespeople would learn to close their mouth, when certain questions are asked, when certain situations come up and allow the customer to go to where they want to, their imagination will take them exactly where you need them to go. And so by shutting up, rather than running your mouth, let me give you a quick example of what this quick tip is about. Sure. Um, have you ever been in the field or heard somebody say, do you have anyone else looking at this home 
because the customer has found something they like. Now, you know, this is kind of a buying signal. They go, do you have anyone else looking at this home? Does that sound like a normal question? Absolutely. What do you think most salespeople would say at that point? Just shoot straight from the hip. What do you think most salespeople would say? I'd say, yeah, we've got a few people that are interested. Right. And that's what I hear all the time. So watch this. Let me be the salesperson for just a moment. And I'll answer the question. And, and you pose it to me. You say, John, Okay, I yeah, sure. Like so, John, I, I, I like this home. You know, do you have, is there anybody else looking at this right now? Oh, my gosh, yes. Uh, I've got a couple of people and I've got a young couple that just like y'all that were just in here this morning. I feel like they might be back this afternoon. So I really wouldn't want you to lose it, you know, just because they may come in any time and take it. And, you know, we've got realtors out there. So I never really know what's going through your mind right this moment as I'm saying all this. Be honest. Uh -oh. what's <laughs> yeah, you've got the, the urgency is elevated. You're going, uh oh, I might lose this. Well, that or I might be BSing you a little bit. That also sure. can go to the customer's mind. They, they could True. be going, oh, yeah, of course he would say that. But watch what happens when we reverse this transaction. And next time somebody asks, do you have anyone else looking at this? And I just go like this. I go. customer is going to become a little uncomfortable for a moment and you know what they're going to say when I do that nine out of ten times I can assure you and I can assure those that are listening or watching this right now when I shut up and I just take a deep breath they're going to look at me and after a moment or so without me saying a word they're going to say you do don't you <laughs> that's when I say you know I don't play that game with people that's exactly what I say. I don't play that game with people. And, you know, I can tell you I've got 10 people looking at it, but what difference would that make? If it's something that you're wanting, I strongly encourage you, let's take the action to go ahead and take it off the market now. But here's why I say when imagination comes in conflict with reality, imagination will always win. When they ask the question, do you have anyone else looking at it? I don't have to answer. And by not answering, they'll come to the conclusion that I do. I let their imagination do the heavy lifting for me. There's the point of this short story. So John, yeah, I think that's super powerful and I'm glad you shared the story there to kind of back up what you meant by that, you know, imagination meeting reality because what's going on in our own heads is always a lot stronger. We can, we can imagine a lot of powerful things, but I've got one more question for you as we wrap up for today, but, um, okay. For anybody that wants to, I guess before we get to that, you know, for anybody that wants to connect with you or learn more about how you can help them, you know, what's a good place to find you online or, or connect and that sort of thing? Just johnpalumbo.com, P-A-L-U-M-B-O.com. And um, you'll be able to connect with uh, everything to what we're doing, articles, resources, uh, a variety of books, um, addressing actually a lot of the things that we talked about here today. <laughs> Because everything that you've hit on, the psychological parts of them are the reason that I have written those specific books to address a lot of the issues that you've talked about here today. So all of those things are there. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll make sure we get that linked up in the show notes. So if anybody's listening, um, just keep an eye on those and you'll be able to click over right to John's website and uh, get access to that or connect with him. And um, I guess as we wrap up for today, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would you share with them? Oh, that's always a good question. <laughs> Just uh, stay on your education. You know, I have a lot of people ask me how, how I have written so many books and, and sold so much real estate over my career. And it goes back to just one thing. It's listening to audio programs, reading books, and taking advantage of the spare time to continue the educational process. Um, that, that's really my secret. And, um, and I would strongly encourage anybody, you know, I like, uh, if, I don't know that Ben Franklin said it exactly this way, but it's close enough. If you fill your, if you empty your purse into your head, your head will eventually fill your purse. So it's, it's, like it's that. a simple formula. Uh, when you stop learning, you stop earning. And I know a few people that I could walk into their offices right now and their most coveted asset is their library. And a lot of it is audio libraries from 
you know, going back years ago when we were listening to audio cassette tapes and then it shifted yeah. over to CD programs. Now it's MP3s and streaming videos and audios. And all of those are still good. You can actually go onto eBay and still buy some of these old audio cassette programs for almost nothing. And the messages on these things are fabulous. You can buy an old audio recorder and play them, or you can convert them into MP3s. There's devices you can buy on eBay that you can convert these programs over in just a minimal amount of time. But whatever you're doing, just continuing the process of listening and learning and educating. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. That's awesome, Parnig advice. And yeah, John, thanks so much for, for joining me today. I think this was really helpful. It's been my pleasure. All right, well, thanks again, John. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode with John Palumbo. Uh, I think we uncovered a lot around the sales world and we dove into lots of things, um, but I know you're on the go, so let's pick out a few action items. And these are the things that I took away from that episode and I think you can take away and start implementing immediately. The first one was around uh, storytelling actually. And I thought he had some good practical advice on how to start documenting your own stories from real examples, real situations, maybe thinking of some metaphors, and just kind of putting those in some notes so that you know, oh, these types of stories are good for these situations or these parts of the sales process. So I think that's a, a huge uh, takeaway that you can start working on. The next one is that if you don't have a documented sales process, definitely put that together. You know, Write down what are the steps that people have to go through to move from start to finish. And then again, I think that paired with the storytelling will really help you uh, go, okay, in this part of the process, I have these few stories. In this part, I have these few stories. Uh, but that way you can, like we talked about, become a master of the process, but then you're able to deviate from it because you've got it documented so well, you know how it should go, then you feel comfortable if something gets thrown off, you're able to deviate from that plan and go with the flow and make sure you're serving that end customer. And then the last takeaway was really John's last point. And you guys know, if you've listened to me, I'm a huge believer in this as well, which is continuous education. So reading books, listening to audiobooks, uh, podcasts, uh, you know, videos that you find, but continually improving your knowledge in different areas that you wanna improve. So if you wanna improve your sales, then start downloading books, um, start buying books on the sales process and improving your sales skills. Um, if it's other areas, then pick up those topics and you can be really strategic about that. So um, those are the three takeaways from today's episode. And again, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Builder Funnel Radio. Mm -hmm.